Well, this morning, um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27, and it's good to be uh, back with you. I've been a couple weeks out. First guy up here in a couple weeks, not sniffling and sneezing, so that's always a good thing, too. Uh, hopefully, I'll make it through without the need for the Kleenex box. Um, but it's good to be back with you. And we're good, good to be back in the Gospel of Luke as we will continue on for some weeks in this Gospel, pressing on through the, the crucifixion and resurrection narratives of Christ and just central, central part of all the Bible. Well, we are into one of the last parables taught by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke this morning. And I would remind you before we look at Luke 19, 11 through 27, what a parable is. All good teachers use illustrations and stories to help make their point, and Jesus did that all the time. He would teach certain theological truths, but to help grasp these things, we often need stories. We just need a clear story that we can relate to that will help us to understand this truth. And so Jesus taught by parables, which is a real, relatable situation, something that we can understand. We'll all be able to understand this story this morning which teaches a central spiritual truth. The parables are not meant to be picked apart in every single detail to find some rock under, uh, some meaning under every single word. It is, it is driven, most of them, for a single spiritual truth. And we'll see this morning what is coming out of this. Because no one parable stands alone. Most of the parables relate to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like this, or the kingdom of God is like this, or the kingdom of God is like this, because the kingdom of God is not a simple matter. It's not something that can be summed up in one story or in one teaching. And so all throughout his ministry, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. And to get our arms around what God is doing, we need to read and understand all these parables. It's like a, a gem or a, a beautiful diamond that has lots of different facets. And as you turn it, you're going to see different aspects of beauty, and it's the same way with the kingdom of God and all the parables that Jesus tells about it. So please, let's stand this morning to honor the Lord as we read his word. Luke 19, 11 through 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. Verse 16. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, You are to be over five cities. Verse 20. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what, did not, what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest." And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. So this parable happens as Jesus is proceeding to Jerusalem. 
All throughout the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. It's where the culmination of his ministry is going to happen. Jesus is not on an accidental journey. He knows he's going to the cross. And so he is getting very close to that. The next, uh, next week, we'll talk about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And the cross of Christ is soon after that. And he's very near to it. And the people can sense in some way that Jesus is nearing some culminating event in his ministry. And it says in verse 11 that they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. They think in some way that Jesus is going to take over politically and deliver them from the Romans and it's getting ready to happen, but they're wrong because they don't understand the ministry of Jesus. And so Jesus tells them this parable to begin to help them and us understand that there's going to be a period between the inauguration and the completion of the kingdom of God. And in the midst of that, there is a duty for us, a way in which we should live, which we are taught by this story. And so overarchingly, we have a nobleman going away to receive a kingdom but will return when he has been given that kingdom, which for us is an understanding that this is the second coming of Christ when all is accomplished and Jesus has been fully given his kingdom. He will return as is the king in this or the nobleman in this passage. But in the meantime, he entrusts stewards with funds to be invested in his absence, that when he returns, he might reckon an accounting of what has been given to these people and what they did during his absence. And so spiritually, this speaks to our faithfulness and our fruitfulness as people living with what God has entrusted us. There is an expectation of growth through application. So let's look through the parable here. In verse 13, it says that this nobleman calls, ten, calls his servants, calls 10 of his servants and gives them 10 minas and says to them, engage in business. So a mina is about 100 days labor wage. So it's a good amount of money, not some extravagant amount of money, but it is a significant amount of money that he entrusts to 10 different people and tells them, go engage in business. He doesn't say, I want a certain amount of money back, and he doesn't, it doesn't say that it's a debt to be repaid, but there is an expectation that with a true and earnest heart, they will take what has been entrusted to them, and they will go out and do something with it and seek to engage in business. They will seek to invest what is there that a return might come from it. Well, as soon as this nobleman goes out, a delegation of the citizens mutiny against him. And this is important. And the second part of verse 14, we do not want this man to reign over us. So as soon as this noble man leaves, the people say, we don't, we don't want this guy. This is not who we want reigning over us. And there is a rebellion amidst a certain part of the people. And we're going to see this comes back into play later on. But not with all of them. Some of them obey and they do exactly what the king has entrusted them and commissioned them to do. So we see in verse 15 that the king does return. It's important that this is not the only parable that's like this in the Bible. There's at least four other parables that speak in some way along these exact same lines. And, and some of the other ones more emphasize the idea of people thinking that he's never going to come back. He's gone and he's never coming back. So we're going to do whatever we want to do. In this, there's very little emphasis on the time. He goes and then he comes back but he comes back. And that's the important thing because the Bible is always talking about the second coming of Christ. And those of us that lose sight and lose interest and lose heart in the second coming of Christ, we need to be reminded by these parables that Jesus is coming again. So verse 15, when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given money to be called to him that he might see what they had gained in doing business. So there was a reckoning. What is a reckoning? A reckoning is when you are called to account, to speak about what it is that you have done, to give an account for yourself. And one of the things that must not be missed here is that we will all, every single one of us here, stand before the throne of God and give an account for our lives before Jesus. And that is a sobering thing. And so we'll, we'll go with that more here in a moment. But these are called to give an reckoning, an account. So the first comes, and the one mina that he had in verse 16 says, I have, 
I have now ten minas. So it's a thousand percent increase in what the Lord had given to him and what he brings back. That's an enormous uh, growth in what has happened there. And so he says, well done. You are faithful. And it, it sort of reminds us of another parable of Jesus, the parable of the soils, the good soil where the seed is sown and, and a great increase comes out of it. And the, the cares of the world and the worries of life don't choke these things out, but instead there's a great fruitful increase. And so the nobleman says, well done, my faithful servant. And he rewards him further. He gives him, uh, let's see, 10 cities, is it? Yes, uh, you'll have authority over 10 cities. So it's an enormous reward in the coming kingdom, the kingdom that he has now brought with him. There is a great reward there. And then we go to the next guy, and this is very important. His one mina has become five. So half is much. Is he disappointed? No, he's pleased and he rewards him proportionally within his kingdom. And this is very important. The person that he is not satisfied with is in verse 20. And so let's look at that. One mina for one mina. But the issue is not necessarily the return. The issue is the faithfulness. What is the explanation that the third person gives? He said, Lord, in verse 20, here is your mina which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. So he just folded it up and stuck it in a drawer. What had the nobleman commanded him to do? He said, go and engage in business. Go do something with this. Don't stick it in the drawer and leave it there until I get back. So the main thing here is that he did not obey what he had been asked to do. He had been charged to go do something, and he did not do it. But why did he not do it? It says, he hid it in the handkerchief because I was afraid of you. So the Bible talks in a number of ways about the fear of God, and, and we'll talk about that more in a moment, but this is, this is not that type of fear. He's literally afraid of him. And so because he knows he is severe, he does not obey him and just sticks it in the drawer and does not obey. So for the sake of fear, he is unfruitful during the period of absence. And so the nobleman is very uh, upset with him. In verse 22, he condemns him. He reprimands him. Why didn't you do something simple at least? You could have just put it in the bank and it would have earned interest and I would have been happy with you. Why did you not at least do something related to what I have asked you to do instead of nothing? And so because he was unfaithful and full of fear and unfruitful, what he has is taken away from him. And what was entrusted to him is given to someone who is, in fact, faithful. And it's given to the person that it was the most fruitful and the most faithful. And so in verse 25, we go back to the rebellious group of people that said, we don't want this man as our king. And they say to him, Lord, he already has 10 minas which means this is not fair. Like this, this, is not, this is not the way we think this thing should work out. But it doesn't matter because the king is the one that is in charge of issuing out what belongs to him. And he says that this is going to happen more often. Those that are not faithful, even what they have will be taken and will be given to those that are faithful and are bold and are fruitful. And so in verse 27 is the end of those that finally reject the king, and it's a sobering end. Those that say, we don't want this man as our king. When he returns in verse 27, he says, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. So there is death for those that ultimately and finally reject the reign and the authority of this king, those that had been given various opportunities and various entrustments, but they will not submit, and they continue in their stiff-necked defiance of the reign of this king that ends in death. And so this is a sobering story, not a light story, not a simple parable, but it is something that has great importance to us. So I'm going to do the best that I can this morning to help you understand the spiritual meaning of this so that we leave walking out of this place today with a desire to live fruitful and faithful lives that when Jesus Christ returns, instead of being ashamed or afraid of his coming, that we might gladly rejoice in hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant, for the life that we have lived 
And so what spiritual lesson was Jesus teaching us in this parable? It's my understanding that Jesus is calling us to faithfulness and to fruitfulness, and that there is an expectation of growth through application while we await his coming. Let me say that one more time. That Jesus is calling us to faithfulness and to fruitfulness with an expectation of growth through application while we await his second coming. I want to be clear about what this parable is not teaching. Because as Americans, I think we can read this parable and come up with a typical American interpretation, which would be, if I work hard enough, God will be happy with me. That is not what this parable is teaching. God does not want you working for him. God does not need anything that you bring to him. So what is entrusted for us is for growth and fruitfulness. And we're going to talk about this more here. But it is not that God is wanting you to work for him. And that if you earn and do enough stuff for God, that God will be pleased with you. Those are the works religions of this world. And this goes back to how each parable has a specific lesson and is not all-encompassing. This parable is not about how we enter the kingdom of God. This parable is about faithfulness once we are in the kingdom of God. And that's a big difference. There are other parables that speak specifically about making entrance into the kingdom of God. But this is a parable about how do we live once we are in Christ Jesus, once we have received salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, once we have trusted Christ and his finished work on the cross, and we are acting out of love for God, not duty to God, that we go and live in a different way. Because we need instruction as to how we are supposed to live as Christians. And so this is a part of that. So if you don't know Christ as your Savior and you have never believed in Him, please don't walk away from this place thinking, oh, God will be pleased with me if I do enough work for Him, because that is not the purpose of this parable. Another way that this is taught often in our day, which can come wrongly from this parable, is the idea of the prosperity gospel, or the idea that the grace of God is demonstrated to us primarily through material blessing. That if I invest my money well for God, he will give me more money back and make me rich. And what I want you to see here is, again, the idea of a parable. A parable is a real story that we can understand and relate to that has a spiritual meaning, a meaning that is greater and more important and deeper than the actual story. People that interpret this parable in a prosperity gospel way They don't ever get to the spiritual. It's only the physical. It's this idea of someone investing and getting more money back, and they never actually get to the spiritual part of it. And so they've missed the whole meaning of the parable. They just take it as a story and live it straight out as it is. But that is not the point of Jesus preaching and teaching parables. And so we must hear clearly the teaching of Christ to love not the world nor the things of the world. And this parable is not about us growing richer in material things. It is meant to be a springboard to help us understand what fruitfulness and faithfulness looks like. So I think to grasp this, it's also helpful for us to look at other analogies and other parables in the Bible. So we're going to look at three. Another one of these analogies in the Bible about growth and fruitfulness and something that is entrusted with an expectation of growth has to do with the parent-child analogy in the Bible. Uh, In the Bible, Jesus is very clear that we ought to call God our Father, our Father who art in heaven. And we are put in the childlike position, an adopted child brought in by grace into the family. But with every healthy parent-child relationship, what is the expectation from the parent to the child? It is of growth and of faithfulness and fruitfulness. Every parent in this room wants to see their child grow up both in body and in mind and in soul and make progress. And we have markers of progress in our children's lives. And if they're not meeting certain markers of progress, we become concerned about them. Not because we hate them, not because we're oppressing them, but because we want to see them grow up. And so for every one of us, 
I think we understand this, and it is the same between God and us, that there is an expectation as we grow up as children that in our action there will be growth and productivity because we love our children and because God loves us. And so similar to a steward entrusting resources to someone and wanting those things to grow, the parent wants the child to grow. Another analogy of this in the Bible is in John 15. If you uh, are interested in turning there, I'm going to turn to John 15, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And this is the vine and fruit analogy that is given, a very important analogy where God is seen as the trunk or the, uh, the vine, and we are seen as the branch. And the branch is not there just to look good, it is to bear fruit. And so let me read a few verses from John 15. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then down to verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And so in a little bit different analogy here, what we have is the, the desire for fruit bearing. That there should be some evidence in our life and a growing and a beautiful evidence of the work of the Lord in our life. And that when someone is growing in this, the Lord even will prune their life to see more fruit grow. But if there is no fruit, the branch is cut off and taken away, which is similar to what we see here in the parable this morning of what is, ha what is not used is taken away. It's a similar concept. But in the fruit-bearing analogy, there is the expectation of growth and of faithfulness. And if you have a branch that is shriveled up with no fruit on it and it's diseased, there is what? There's a problem. There's something not right here that needs to be addressed, and it's not okay for a person to be in Christ and bear no fruit. It's not okay for a child to grow, to physically grow up, but make no progress. And it's not okay for a person to be entrusted with the resources of God and do absolutely nothing with them. The third analogy here that I think is helpful and along the same lines has to do with hearing and doing in the Bible. Constantly, we are called for in the Bible to not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. If we look in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, 22 through 25, James writes this, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intensely at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so, again, similar. This person in the parable has been entrusted with some good thing by God. They have heard what they have been charged with. Now, will they go and do? Will they act? Or will they wrap it in a napkin and just go sit on it? We are called over and over in the Bible to be doers of God's word. The things that we hear, the things that strike your heart when you read the scriptures or hear the word of God preached, and you know, I should be about that. That is right. That is good. Do you do anything with that? Or do you go home and just sit it on a shelf and get distracted and forget? There should be a progression of growth. It's important that in this parable and in every single one of these analogies, there is a progression over time. It takes time for a fruit-bearing tree to bear fruit. If you've ever planted a fruit tree, it can be frustrating. You go for years with no fruit until this thing reaches fruit-bearing age, and then all of a sudden you start getting fruit but you start getting fruit eventually. You can have investments that you invest in like, man, nothing is happening here. But then eventually the investment begins to pay off. We, we can have children that are a struggle for a time, but over time the Lord honors our efforts in their lives and we see good things come from that. And so hearing and doing. There's a problem with stunted child growth. There's a problem with non-fruit-bearing trees. And there's a problem with hearing only and not doing. So in our parable today, Jesus is clear 
that in the interim between his ascension to heaven and his second coming, in this interim period, that our lives ought to be variously marked by fruitfulness and faithfulness. And I think it's interesting, in this parable and every other one that's similar to it, there's not just one example of the amount of return. There's various returns, which means our lives are going to be variously marked with the work of the Lord. We are not all going to look the same in the way that we serve the Lord because each of us have been entrusted by God's Holy Spirit with different gifts and different abilities. And the fruitfulness and the the use of those things are going to display themselves differently in different people's lives. God is not looking for us to all be the same and do the same. He is calling for us and requires of us to be faithful, to act, to do something. Don't wrap your talents up and stick them in a drawer and do nothing with them. That is what is unacceptable to the Lord Jesus. Every great Christian biography I have ever read, whether it be a missionary or a preacher or a businessman or whatever it may be that I have read, not a single one of these biographies were ever written about a person that had a life of much personal relaxation that was well entertained and went out and served the Lord when it was convenient to them. Never. You will not find any biography like that on that shelf back there. Instead, the biographies that are written, the lives that we want to remember and are inspired by are lives of Christian people that were deeply faithful. And because they were deeply faithful, they were deeply fruitful. And they wanted their lives to be poured out in service to Jesus Christ. And they were constant, earnest, true-hearted spiritual efforts in their life that the Lord God honored and brought great fruitfulness out of their lives in blessing other people and the church. And so I would ask you, how about you? You who have been called by God to salvation you who have been forgiven of your sins by grace and by truth, you who are God's workmanship, I encourage you to see and remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, after this wonderful passage of how we've been saved by grace through faith, and it's not us that should boast. And it ends this way in Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a plan for your life. This parable is setting out the idea that there is an expectation of faithfulness and growth. But it is very specific in your life. God knows your name and has made you in a certain way and given you certain gifts and talents and abilities. And he has a plan for your life. Good works that are set out before us to walk in. And so I would ask you to consider these things, to look at your life and say, what does the Lord have for me? What gifts, what abilities, what talents has God entrusted to me that I feel like are specific to me? And what would the Lord God have me to do with those things? And Lord God, help me to be busy with these things. Help me to go out and serve you, not out of some sense of duty that I am earning your favor, but because I love you. I want to serve you, and I want to go out and be faithful with what has been entrusted to me. I believe this is the central heart of this parable. And so what does this faithful and fruitful Christian life look like? I'd I'd like to give you four things just to kind of hang some thoughts on. What does this faithful and fruitful Christian life look like? Well, I believe it is first, it must be characterized by a love for Jesus and looking for his coming. A love for Jesus. The, we don't get the sense from this parable that these servants just did this out of a great sense of duty, that they were glad to serve this king. Whereas others hated this king and were mutinying against him, they accepted his kingship and served him with love and with gladness. And so it should be with us that we should love Christ and look for his coming, and that we should be faithful and steady and expectant and hopeful and joyful in the way that we serve the Lord every day. Second, I believe that this faithful and fruitful Christian life must be marked by holiness. It must be marked by a striving to obey the commands of God. Jesus says, if, we lo- if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my commandments will not be burdensome. That's a beautiful passage. We cannot say that we honor this king, this soon and coming king, when we disobey his clear moral commands. And so our life must be marked by holiness. 
So a love for Jesus, a desire for holiness, a striving for holiness. But then third, a missional life. A missional life where we are seeking the souls of other people. The economy of the kingdom of God is not the same as the economy of this world. That's where if you never get past the, the parable story to the spiritual meaning behind it and stay only with the monetary example given, you've missed the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not made of money and investments and the buying and selling of properties. Jesus came to do what? to seek and to save the lost. The kingdom of God is about the salvation of souls and the glory of God through the redemption of men and women and boys and girls. And so any person that is truly faithful and fruitful in the Christian life is going to have a deep concern for the souls of other people before God. Whether it be souls in your own family, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, or the souls of lost people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ in another land. We must care about the souls of lost people, and we must tell them about Jesus. So the fourth thing, I believe, of what a faithful and fruitful Christian looks like is that they are marked by sacrificial service. We are marked by love for Christ. We are marked by holiness. We are marked by a missional attitude towards lost people, and we are marked by sacrificial service, a care for the poor and the needy. Uh, Just last week, Jenner talked about this some. We are marked by mercy towards the sick and the weak and the elderly, sharing in the sufferings of Christ by serving them. And so all of this increasing and growing in our life is what a a faithful Christian, a a fruit-bearing tree, a steward that is faithful with what God has given them looks like. And so I would ask you, if someone was observing your life, this, is, this parable is about someone looking at the lives of other people. If someone was observing your life as an objective outside observer, what would they see? Would they see a life marked by a genuine love of Christ, um, a life marked by holiness and missional, sacrificial service, or would they see a very materialistic, self-centered life? Because we will all one day give an account for our lives before Christ. We will all stand and give a reckoning before the Lord. And may we be found faithful and not fearful so that in that day when we stand by grace and because of the cross of Christ Jesus, there may be no fear in how we have lived our lives. Let's be honest that the life goals of most Americans do not revolve around these things. Most American lives are not lived for the love of Christ and the glory of God and missional and sacrificial living. The typical American life is very self-centered, related to self-image, related to entertainment, related to self-preservation through affluence. They do not want the kingship of Jesus. We don't want this man ruling over us. So many people feel that way about Jesus. I don't want Jesus ruling over my life. But those who love Jesus are glad for his kingship and glad for his lordship and know that the way of Christ is a way of blessing and a way of life. And so I would end by hearing these words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this parable and for this time together. I pray for these things. These are, this is a sobering passage. It makes every one of us, including myself, take deep stock of my life. What, what am I doing with what has been entrusted to me? I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and your mercy, for I know that it is impossible that I work my way into the favor of God. It cannot be done. Only by the cross of Christ and the grace of Jesus extended to me can I be saved. But Lord, I know that through this, I have a great desire to serve you because I love you and I've seen the salvation of God in my own life and I desire to see it in other people's as well. And so I pray for our church. I pray for every single person here today that we would desire to serve you out of a great passion and a great love and that we would be reminded again of your second coming. And that we would not be idle in our lives, but that we would see ourselves as stewards entrusted with gifts 
and that we would go out and serve and use those things. And as the parable says, do business for God, that we would be faithful, engaging, and seeking to honor the Lord in our life and, and follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit as to what we should do and say and be each day. Because all those leadings always take us to a place that is beyond ourselves, a place that is fearful. But Lord, I pray that as a people, that we would not be fearful, that we would not be marked by a fear of the world, but instead would be marked as those who are bold and courageous and seek to live for, out of a love for Jesus, missionally and sacrificially, and that the world would see the goodness of God in our lives. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things would be true of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.